Good afternoon. Welcome, everybody, and thank you for joining us for today's program. Uh, I'm Connor. I'm the Outreach Coordinator here at the Wildlife Center of Virginia, and joining me is Michael, our front desk team lead. Thank you for joining us today, Michael. Thanks for having me. Awesome, and we're, we're pretty excited for today's program because today we're going to be talking all about baby season at the, the Wildlife Center of Virginia, and that's something that has is already underway. Um, starting in, in February, I think we got our first baby patients of the year, and it's just taken off since then, so it's a good time to talk about it. Um, this is the time of year where we are getting the most patient admissions. Um, we'll probably, during the, during the baby season, we'll probably get somewhere close to 2,000 patients. Um, and that means every single day, um, soon we'll be seeing somewhere between 15 and 30 patients a day. So what that also means is that for all of you guys that are tuning in and watching today, that it's probably the time of year where you're more likely to come across a young animal that you're concerned about that you think might be injured uh, might be orphaned or, or something else going on and you might need help. Uh, so today we're hoping that this program uh, will give you guys a little bit of context on the, the common animals that we admit here at the center during baby season. Those common ones being squirrels, cottontails, possums, songbirds, and fawns. And we'll also touch on a couple others. Um, so you guys can maybe have a better understanding of what's going on with that species and um, what you guys can do to help them during this, um, you know, the start of their lives here. Uh, so uh, that being said, I feel like the good place to start is uh, with squirrels because they were, um, I think, Michael, the, the first patients that we, uh, baby patients we admitted this year with squirrels? Yes, I believe so in February. Um, first little leave, they were juveniles at that time. So that gives you an idea of even before February oh, wow. month, we're already kind of getting into baby season, creeping into it. Yeah, and they're they're interesting. They're I would say squirrels are usually the first baby patients that we admit each year, um, but they're also maybe one of the last ones of the year we'll admit too, because they have um, two distinct breeding seasons. Um, do you know when that when that would be, Michael? Yeah, I mean, obviously, right around this time, or rather, several weeks before, a month before, around this time is when you're starting to see the first batch of, of infant squirrels um, being born. Um, when I first started back in August, um, that I was also seeing the same age, you know, infant and juvenile squirrels. So sort of that tail end of summer, even into the early fall, we're still seeing plenty of um, newborn um, or juvenile squirrels. I believe even getting infants or juveniles as late as October or November. Yeah. Of this year from, from what I remember. Yeah, so they're definitely one that, you know, they've got a, having two distinct breeding seasons, it's one that people are, are definitely likely to come across at some point. Um, and I think when people think about squirrels during, you know, during baby season, they, they typically picture them nesting in trees. Um, a lot of you out there have probably seen those, those drays, those kind of like balls of leaves and, and twigs and trees, especially here um, on the, you know, the end of winter, early spring, when it's kind of easier to see them, the trees don't have all their leaves yet. Uh, but squirrels will also readily use a lot of other sources for nesting. Isn't that right? Yes, absolutely. I mean, a lot of times, actually, what you're seeing uh, this first um, breeding season for squirrels is they'll make use of a lot of already like pre-made structures, um, whether those are natural structures like tree cavities, um, and which is a lot of what we're seeing now. Um, a lot of times squirrels will use um, cavities and trees, but they're just as readily using uh, man-made structures. Um, I'm sure you've heard of squirrels in your attic before, but even on the eaves of houses um, in like semi-permanent outdoor structures. Um, so squirrels will make use of many different, um, you know, kinds of natural man-made structures. Um, and that's why it's, you're not always sure, you're not always expecting to come across a squirrel or a nest of squirrels <laughs> when you do. Yeah, I'm pretty sure when I when I started at the front desk, we had some that um, people found them in their in their cars and vehicles. Um, they found them in grills that weren't being used. Uh, so had some gutter squirrels this year. Some gutter squirrels, some rain gutters. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, sometimes you know they they pop up in a place you're not expecting, and because of that, um, it can be easy to accidentally disturb that nest. Maybe you're moving your grill and the nest falls out, or or something along those lines. Maybe you're working on your gutters and you actually knock one out. Um, if that's the case and someone disturbs a nest of, of squirrels, um, what can they do? What, what should they do? 
Well, ideally, um, the infants or juveniles are going to be uninjured. I mean, that's essential, obviously, to being able to um, leave them where they are. But squirrel moms are clever. Um, they'll often have one or two <clears throat> backups, um, not fully developed nests, really, but areas where in case our primary nest fails, um, they are usually able to move their infants one by one um, to a new nest location. So um, if we do come across them in something like a gutter, where it's obviously not an ideal and not really a permanent nest site, um, it's very possible to still reunite these guys with their mom if they're, again, um, uninjured and, and seemingly healthy. Um, and that's really the ideal scenario. They're one that I think, you know, of the different types of animals that we, we attend for nesting, I think they're the one, one of the ones that we, we have more success with. You know, the moms are pretty good about coming and, and grabbing them by the scruff and bringing them back up to the nest or, or to their backup nests. Um, and how, how does a person, if, if the nest is completely destroyed, um, you know, assuming they call a wildlife rehabilitator, they already determined that the squirrels aren't injured. So renesting is something that's best. Um, how, how should they go about renesting? What's, what, how would they do that if they can't use that original nest? Yeah, um, so basically we want to, um, really one of the few things, one of the only things we want somebody to provide an animal, um, an infant like that is um, supplemental heat. A lot of times, you know, these, these babies or even juveniles are too young to properly regulate their own body temperature. Um, so besides that, all we want to really do is provide a safe area as close to the original nest location as possible, um, where these guys can remain warm and protected as much as possible from potential predators, from humans, domestic animals is a big worry, a big concern. Um, it's leave these guys uh, kind of in precarious positions sometimes. We're not protected in a nest. Um, but any container that we have where we can put in a supplemental heat source, um, like a warm rice sock, um, a warm water bottle, even uh, a heating pad if possible on low, um, really we just want to provide that container, supplemental heat. And what we can do um, to try to encourage mom to find them more quickly is to even play um, audio of infant squirrel noises, uh, infant squirrel distress calls, um, so the mom can more quickly find them and hopefully retrieve them and bring them to a safer place. That's definitely a, a helpful trick to know, playing those, those calls. Um, and yeah, so that's, that's, our, that's our ultimate goal is to you know, get that animal reunited with the parents. Um, you, know, you can call a rehabber to be in contact with them as you're re-nesting. Um, or reuniting to, to make sure you're, you know, going through the process correctly. Um, but unfortunately, a lot of times they, they may become injured or they may be injured in the first place and have to come in or, or something along those lines. So for the patients that we do have coming in, for all these squirrels that we've recently got, what are the common causes of admission that we're seeing for them? Um, well, um, a lot of times it's, it's the primary cause. Um, the nest being destroyed um, is something that we see often, whether that's um, on accident or, you know, a lot of times um, the, if they're in tree cavities, those are older dying or dead trees that people are purposefully taking down. And that's what we've been seeing a lot, especially this um, beginning of this baby season is people are, are purposefully removing, manicuring trees, taking down dead trees. And that's where we'll come across these squirrels. Um, so sometimes they can be injured in that process of taking down the tree. Um, but that is, that is, I, I feel like that's the primary thing I've seen personally so far is that um, nest destruction. But also um, a lot of times the cause can be secondary. If we fall out of a nest, but we're not really injured, um, it wasn't really a, a, a large fall and we're um, seemingly okay, you know, but then we're more exposed to potential predation um, from, we see a lot of domestic cats, unfortunately, or dogs um, that don't necessarily attack an animal, but anytime um, an infant, uh, any wild infant animal is found in the mouth or claws of a cat or dog, um, that's cause enough for concern to want to get it some, some veterinary care um, at a permitted facility. Okay, so it sounds like, you know, nest, nest disturbances, um, and then secondary to that, predators, whether it's, you know, a wild predator, or maybe more often we're seeing, you know, domestic cats or, or domestic dogs that are getting to them. Yeah. Um, so what's some, some advice we can give to people who maybe want to try to prevent those injuries or accidents from occurring in the first place? 
Um, prevention is always the best thing, especially for nest disturbances. Um, again, sometimes if we're uh, being found in a gutter or an attic that has needs work done on it, it's always not a, it's not a viable permanent nest if, if it can't remain undisturbed um, until they they mature. Um, but really checking any any nests or any um, trees for potential nests if we know that we're going to be taking them down. Um, also, really ideally keeping any domestic pets indoors, you know, that preventative measure um, would already go a really, really long way in preventing some of the unnecessary admissions that we have here um, for infants who, again, aren't necessarily injured when they come out of the nest or fall. Yeah. Um, it's when they're exposed like that and a cat or a dog comes along and, and finds them at that point. So really um, trying to just be mindful, I think, is the overall rule is if we're uh, potentially disturbing a nest, check first. Um, but keeping cats and dogs indoors and um, is is really the best medicine. Prevention is the best medicine. So I think um, just to add to that, one thing also, if you're considering any major projects or tree work, um, you can also, if you have the option, think about maybe doing that outside of like the, the squirrel breeding season or, or a time when you're more likely to disturb a nest. Um, and I can see in the chat that we're getting some some great comments here. I see Lacey said that one of her favorite memories from working at the front desk uh, was helping someone reunite a baby squirrel with its mom. We always love those success stories. Um, so uh, if anyone has any comments or questions, feel free to, to post it in the chat as we're talking here. We want to make this an interactive discussion. Um, if it's something, you know, if it's a specific ongoing wildlife scenario, um, probably not the best, best area to, to address this. I would call the front desk for something like that. They're here. They're ready to help you. Um, but if it's more generalized questions about baby season or things that you can do um, or comments, please post them in the chat. We definitely want to, to see what you guys are interested in knowing. Um, but I guess moving on from squirrels, we'll go on to our, our next common mammal that we'll get. And I think each year this one ends up probably being either the first or second most highly admitted species. And that is, is cottontails. And this is one that people come across so, so often. Um, why? I don't know, what's the reason why this one's, you know, people find this animal more often than others? Um, I think um, there are a lot of different reasons for that. I think similar to squirrels, cottontails, breeding season extends throughout pretty much the entire spring and, and summer. You know, we're basically, um, they have multiple litters a year. Um, and just like squirrels, a lot of times these, these nests, which are on the ground, of course, are often accidentally stumbled upon. Um, but because they have usually a larger litter um, than squirrels will too, you know, that's, that's probably one reason if a nest is disturbed um, or becomes um, not viable for one reason or another, it's not safe to try to keep them in that nest, um, then, you know, we have a bunch of cottontail infants or juveniles coming in at once. Um, but that, that's cottontails in order to, to propagate, have so many babies because of um, just their natural history and development. So um, I think just the sheer abundance of them is, is one reason. But being a slightly more terrestrial, I would say, animal too, um, kind of naturally leaves them open to more of that possible predation, um, accidental destruction of nests. Um, we had already uh, five or six, I believe, come in today. So. They are definitely in the middle or the start, I guess, of, of breeding season for the cottontails for, for admitting them. And yeah, that makes sense. Being, you know, being nesting on the ground, um, easier to come across that type of nest for people than maybe one that's up in a tree or something. That high reproductive rate, just they're all over the place. So it makes sense that people are coming across them more often. And I think one of the, the major concerns I remember people calling about is when they find a nest, um, they look around and they don't see the mom and they become really concerned saying, why is the mom not around? Um, but, but that's sort of normal for cottontails, right? Yeah. Um, and that speaks to um, a general sense of so, so often our job is not only to get, you know, injured orphan animals here, but keeping healthy animals that aren't actually orphaned where they should be. Um, so like you said, somebody will come across um, little cottontail infants or juveniles who are just starting to peek out of the nest. You know, they develop really quickly. So they're already exploring immediately, immediately outside the nest area at a pretty young age. Um, but when people don't see a mom immediately nearby, 
you know, that's when they become concerned that these guys are orphaned, you know, assuming maybe that something has happened to the mother. Um, but there's a couple of reasons why you won't see mom, um, mainly because they are crepuscular. So the mom is only going to be coming to that nest really around um, the very early morning hours or around dusk once the, once the sun starts to go down. Um, she doesn't want to hang around the nest all day because she might attract predators to that nest. Um, but um, really, uh, we, we have to often remind people that, um, you know, if you don't see mom, you know, she is a, a wild animal who has uh, adapted to evade predators. So they're really good at, you know, staying out of sight. So just because you don't see it doesn't mean it's not there. And we, I guess that's, that's what we are to them. We are predators. So mm -hmm. for those people that are, are concerned, a lot of them are watching that nest closely, but maybe, maybe too closely. That rabbit can, the mother might see you nearby and not want to come around because we're actually there. A person's there. Um, so um, just because you don't see a mom, it doesn't mean that they're not being cared for. Likely she's just coming back later at dawn and dusk. Um, another thing I think we hear a lot with, with nests, you, you mentioned earlier that, you know, they're more, more vulnerable to predators because they they nest in depressions on the ground. Um, and people are concerned that maybe they're in an exposed area. It's not really safe. You know, maybe they feel like their, their dog or their cat or something else will come along and get them. And they want to move them to what they feel is a safer location. Uh, but that's a, not a good idea, right? Exactly. Yeah. Um, squirrel, I mean, I'm sorry, uh, cottontail mothers are extremely visually oriented when it comes to finding their nests. So they won't, they'll use um, clues and context of, of their environment to find where they originally uh, put that nest. So moving the nest, you know, they're not going to by sound or by sight, uh, be able to find infants um, or juveniles that have been moved, even say, 20, 30 feet in, in any direction. Um, it, it really, it, it basically, um, if we attempted to move cottontail juveniles or infants, we'd almost have to consider them orphaned at that point, at that point, because mom just will not be able to find them and continue caring for them. Yeah. I remember handling those calls at the front desk and every time someone had moved, moved a nest, um, prior to calling, even just a couple feet, mm -hmm. um, usually the mom did not come back and care for them. So it's so important that even if you don't feel it safe, um, the mom does. That's where she kept them. She, you know, we got to respect that that they know best, and also that she's only going to come back if that nest is in that exact spot. Um, but another reason we receive calls a lot of times is because they do find one of those baby bunnies outside the nest. And um, what should someone do if 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 that's the case? If they, you know, are maybe walking through their backyard, they just find a baby bunny on the ground, they're not sure what's going on, but it's not in the nest at that point, what advice would you give them in that situation? Well, the first thing I would tell anyone is to never try to approach or capture um, uh, any wild animal, but, you know, especially um, a, a cottontail uh, baby. Um, cottontails in general are extremely prone to the negative physiological effects of stress um, so trying to chase them is going to stress them out. It could be, you know, very harmful to their actual health. Um, <clears throat> but the, um, um, other than that, <clears throat> um, I'm sorry, Connor, I got lost here for a second. No, no, no problem. I think that, um, you know, a big, a big part of what we're going to do is try to figure out if those animals, you know, if that rabbit, first of all, is injured or not, you know, if it's injured or if it, if it's healthy, you know, because if it is, if it is injured, that's pretty, pretty easy to know what to do. We got to get that to a wildlife rehabilitator. For yeah. Care. But I guess if it's not injured and, you know, we determine over the phone that it's not old enough to, to be on its own yet. And we can do that several ways. You know, we can have people send in photos to us, which is often helpful for us to determine it. Um, we have specific questions. We'll ask them to determine the age of certain patients. Or certain animals. Um, so if we find out that it's not old enough, um, we'll usually try to, to re-nest them. We'll try to, you know, tell the person to look around nearby. Likely the, um, the nest is somewhere nearby. We'll tell them it's a depression in, in the ground. And usually they're, you know, you can see them, the depressions in the ground are lined with tufts of the, of the mother's fur um, or, or soft grasses, you know, can sometimes be a bit concealed, a bit tricky to find, but hopefully um, they'll be able to find them and put them back. But then the secondary concern with that that people have is if I'm not going to see the mom, 
um, how do I know that that rabbit is, you know, the, the mother's continuing to come back and care for them after I re-nest them? So how, um, is there any tricks we can apply to make sure that that mom is coming back or, or figure out whether she's not coming back? Yeah, there, there are a lot of different ways. Um, and I mean, if you have something like a trail cam, that's awesome. Um, that's a, you know, super high tech, really, you know, you can get a good confirmation that that mom is coming back if you actually see her, if you could set up something like that. But, you know, most people don't necessarily have access to that sort of thing. Um, and so a really, really simple version of that, basically seeing evidence of mom's return, uh, we often suggest what's called the tic-tac-toe test. So uh, if you're able to find the nest um, and you're trying to determine if the adult, the mother is returning, laying shoestrings, um, very thin twigs, um, something similar to that across the nest in a tic-tac-toe-like pattern, you know, a, a very um, obvious shape and design um, as a person that you can tell the next day if something like that, if something were coming in and out of the nest, you would see an obvious disturbance in those strings, those twigs, something, the tic-tac-toe figure has been disturbed somehow. So that's, um, you know, especially if we're still seeing thriving, living babies in that nest, um, after the fact, if we see a disturbance, it's a pretty good bet mom is there and, and she is still caring for them and returning. That's pretty cool too, how they have like the, uh, the, the really high tech answer of like a, a nice camera to watch that nest. Also something as low tech as a couple of twigs, making that pattern on the nest is, is just as helpful. Exactly. Um, and if you happen to have a camera and you put it out, you might also catch uh, just a really cool moment in nature that you, you don't see quite as often. Um, so that's something cool that people can certainly try. Um, and for cottontails, um, I guess let's, let's go over what are some of the common causes of admission for them? Um, I do see one comment um, from Lydia in, in um, the chat here that says, um, that she has, you know, sometimes people often come across them because they're, they're mowing their lawns and they oftentimes don't know a nest is there and they mow right over the nest. Um, and that can sometimes destroy the nest, um, maybe injure the rabbits, maybe not injure the rabbits. Um, so that's one, you know, one, one way they're coming into our center sometimes. What are some of the other concerns that we're seeing? Um, yeah, I think that is one of the major ones. I still think the, um, it rings true for cottontails as well. Um, that dog and cat, you know, interactions with domestic animals still constitute probably the main, you know, yeah. cause of admission um, for, for those guys at the, at the center. Um, other than that, um, it will be in the off chance, um, something else either natural or otherwise can disturb the nest or uh, actually destroy it and make it totally unviable. Something like a, a collision with lawn equipment. Uh, but also even when people uh, have brush piles where um, cottontails will often make nests, make use of that brush pile, um, a lot of times they will, um, without checking the nest first, you know, burn that brush. Um, and that can be a very unfortunate, you know, circumstance a, a cottontail can find themselves in. Um, so one more sort of um, reminder to sort of be proactive and, and preventative and checking things like brush piles if you have them like are there critters in here and if so um, you know hold off on that for now yeah definitely prevention prevention is key and I think um, you're so right on like the, the cats and dogs being a large cause of admission I think that's something that will probably through most of the babies we're going to talk about that's probably going to be one of the large causes so it's so important that um, if, you know, any of you guys who are listening have dogs and cats, you know, if you have cats, um, outdoor cats, you might want to consider transitioning them to an indoor lifestyle because that's really the only way to protect these wild animals. Um, and like I said, cottontails being more susceptible to that because they are located on the ground, um, outdoor pets are more likely to come across them. And if you have dogs, either keep them on leashes or, or maybe be there to monitor them to make sure nothing, nothing goes wrong. Um, and for rabbits too, um, the good thing about them, if you know, if you have a dog that you like to take in your backyard, but it, maybe it finds that rabbit nest and um, you want to avoid having that dog in the area is that the rabbits grow up very quickly. So at about, was it like three weeks, they're, they're ready to leave that nest, something around that. Um, yeah, um, pretty much fully independent, uh, you know, in a lot of ways at, at under a month of age. Um, by the time I think it's, uh, the comparison is uh, softball size, I think. Um, 
you know, that's at the point where they're going to be purposefully leaving the nest. So especially then is when you don't want, you know, you can assume that these guys are safe and independent and you don't want to try to chase them around or um, it's always good to double check and verify um, with pictures um, with a facility or organization such as ours. But um, yeah, the good thing, like you said, is it will only be um, a short while relatively where these guys will be in the danger zone, you know, when they're subject to that sort of predation and, and um, environmental hazards. Yeah. And um, I do, I have to mention, I do see a great comment from Lacey in the chat when you mentioned about the brush piles. She said, brush piles, AKA rabbitats, habitat for rabbits. Got That's look right. <laughs> um, uh, but yeah, yeah, they, they grow up very quickly. Um, and I think another running theme you'll hear us say throughout this program is, um, while this will give you guys some like context and knowledge for what to do, it's always okay and, and good to check with a rehabber where, where, you know, whether it's our center or another rehabilitator, we're here um, to help you guys figure out what's going on when you see things. So, and always, to that, to that okay. point too, um, you know, there's not, even though we can, you know, we see generally the same timeline and the same situations year to year. Um, there's not always a one size fits all answer. So it's always good to talk through with somebody the specifics of, of a situation. It's a lot of creative problem solving that we do here. That's true. I think the, as, as long as you work at the front desk, there will always, always be new things that you're experiencing almost every single day. So everything, you know, it's not one size fits all. Sometimes we have to take lots of factors into account. So always good to check with, with a rehabilitator. Um, but moving on to our next mammal and one of my favorites, uh, possums, which I think uh, as people that see the overlay we have for this program, you can see they're one of my favorites because the one I chose. Um, they, they're just such unique animals um, and they're, they're very different than a lot of the other animals that we admit our center. What makes possums unique? Uh, the, the, what stands out to me always, and what I still, when I first started working here, I learned for the first time, I, I, or I guess I was able to put uh, into words, is that they are the only marsupial found in the United States, which I just think is a really awesome, incredible thing. It makes them such uh, unique, interesting animals. Um, so like kangaroos or other animals, they'll have a pouch, you know, where they'll, they're their young will do majority of their development, um, especially that in those early stages. So I think that's a really awesome thing about opossums. Yeah, I think we actually have um, a couple photos that we can share with people showing like the, the, the different age groups for possums as they age, because they start out as pouch young. They start out in the pouch. They're about the size of a jelly bean, not fully developed, no hair, no eyes, um, you know, completely dependent on the mom suckling um, inside the her pouch there and then they start to grow older they become infants they have hair eyes are still closed or maybe just opened um, they're more developed but they're not ready to leave the pouch quite yet they'll still stay in there and then eventually they'll move on to, to the juvenile stage where um, they they leave the pouch they they are fully fur you know hair eyes open they look sort of like miniature versions of the adult at that point I would say um, and at this point, they're actually going to cling to the mom's back for a while. So they're not quite going off on their own yet when they leave the pouch. They kind of cling to her back as she's going around um, until they're at the point where they're old enough to be on their own. Um, but because they, you know, they live in the mom's pouch, um, what makes them a, a little bit different if we find a young possum that's not old enough to be on its own and it's alone? we don't see the mother around, what makes that situation a little bit different than with other animals that we might see alone without the mother around? Yeah, that is one of the few cases where we can, with relatively little information um, or regarding the circumstances of how it came to be there, we can pretty definitively assume that that animal is orphaned. Um, essentially, if once we've, like you said, we have been knocked off or fall off or did, you know, somehow off of mom at any of those stages in which they would normally be clinging to her, whether in the pouch or on her back, um, once they have been removed or dislodged from that, <clears throat> mom is not going to come back and retrieve them. Um, so it's, while it's good that we can, you know, we know what to do in that situation because we know that animal's orphaned, um, it's obviously makes it tougher because we can't reunite at that point with the mother. We have to seek care at a 
permitted rehabilitator. Yeah, like unlike you know a lot of other mammals that will recognize that maybe its baby is missing or if they hear it come back and get them. Possums are nomadic, and if one of those babies gets separated, mom's just going to keep on going, not even realizing that, you know, something happened to that one, it got separated, and now mm -hmm. it becomes orphan at that point. Um, and possums are another one of the most highly admitted patients here at our center. Why, why do young opossums usually come to the center? Um, young opossums will, you know, those orphaned opossums who are still dependent on the mother, it will be often because something has happened to the mother. Um, so often it's vehicle collisions. Um, opossums are, you know, a lot of people will see them sort of slowly sauntering across the road. Um, and because they're sort of, they're omnivores, um, a lot of that roadside debris, litter, trash um, that might have food in it, that's what, you know, gets these adults in the road. The, the mother um, is hit. And then we have uh, maybe injured or at the very least orphan babies if the mother is, you know, deceased. Um, so I think car collisions is probably the number one. Um, going back to the same uh, attacks by dogs, um, I think are, are a big one. Probably, a, I, maybe you could say confidently, um, dog attacks on opossums are a little more frequent than cat attacks. Yeah, I agree um, on that. Maybe because of the size, um, but um, animal attacks and vehicle collisions, I think, are the number one um, because, like you said, opossums aren't going to have a nest that's destroyed or disturbed, really. So usually, something happening to the adult is the is what sets everything else in motion. Yeah, and I'd say for for those vehicle collisions, a lot of times, what you know, we kind of like to say here at the center that no litter is safe litter. So we don't know the exact circumstances for every vehicle collision, but a lot of the times if people are going down the roadways and they have any food litter that they decide to throw out their vehicle, they don't think that they're causing harm, you know, it's biodegradable. Um, but the problem is it'll attract those animals to a dangerous area, the road. Um, so sometimes possums will, will cross that road and get hit by vehicles. And um, another thing that we know is they, they don't understand the concept of cars. You know, if there's a car heading their way, we can't expect them to move out of the way and, and get to the side of the road. A lot of times they'll freeze up. Um, sometimes they might become blinded by headlights and actually head towards the vehicle. Um, so something that we can do, you know, make sure we're not not throwing any litter out of the vehicle or waiting to, to get where we're going to properly dispose it. Um, or, you know, just slowing down a little bit, especially at dawn and dusk um, or at night when they're going to be more active. Um, keep an eye out for them near the side of the road so we can make sure we're, we're trying not to hit them. Um, but even if people, you know, are as safe as possible, we know that vehicle collisions happen. And for, for mothers that have infants in the pouch, if someone comes across a mother that was hit by a car and the mom's deceased, but she does still have those infants in the pouch, they can either, you know, see them moving around or if someone happens to check in the pouch and they see them, what should they do at that point for those infants? Well, ideally, whoever comes across a deceased mother um, would be able to safely pull over on the side of the road. You know, we, we really don't want anybody pulling off on like a major highway, of course, for the human yeah. safety element. Um, but if we can um, safely pull over and check the mother, uh, check her pouch to see if there are any infants. Um, and if so, especially to, to try to see if they're alive. Um, you know, we've had so many situations in the past where mother is deceased, but um, a large majority, if not all of her babies, are able to survive um, because we're able to um, get them the care they need uh, because somebody took the time and the effort to, to check the mom's pouch. Um, and one important thing with that, too, is um, even though we, we want somebody, you know, ideally with gloves, some sort of PPE, you know, for, for germs and, and, and um, safety and that sort of thing, um, we also don't want anyone to try to remove um, the babies from the mother's pouch. A lot of times, um, you know, anytime we can be hands off with an infant animal and contain it and get it care, the better anyway. Um, but a lot of times these babies will still be, you know, suckling um, within the pouch um, on the nipple at the, of the opossum. And um, Connor, you might be able to speak to this a little more specifically, but they are they cling to her in such a way where removing them from her could actually be harmful. Yeah, so they it's 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 a bit unique compared to the animal how far I think it goes like in their mouth and down their, their throat, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Um and 
also, you know, young possums, especially pouch young, are, are not fully developed. They're a lot more fragile at that point. So um, I think, you know, bringing them into a rehabber who has the training and skills to um, remove them from, from the nipple without causing any harm is important. So yeah, bringing them, bringing the mom in um, to the wildlife center or to another rehabilitator where they can safely remove it, I think is, is really important. Um, and that's also for possums, one of the reasons why they're, they're so often admitted here at the center is because one admission can turn into 14. If a, if a mom comes in and that mom can have up to, up to 13 young in its pouch, you know, they can care for up to 13 young, then we're, we might be admitting 14 patients at a time. Um, so that's one of the reasons why we're seeing them so often as well. Uh, but what should someone do if they find a, a young possum that is, is not quite, you know, an infant, it looks more like it's the juvenile stage and they're not quite sure, is this one that's old enough to be on its own yet? Is there some way that people can maybe tell whether that possum is ready to be on its own? Um, well, I think this is where, again, um, we live, thankfully, in a day and age where taking pictures and sending them um, either by email or even by text um, can, you can get a professional's opinion. You know, we have somebody who has a better grasp on aging um, the opossums based on relative size, um, other features that, um, you know, I constantly have to look up in our resources um, comparisons to everyday objects to see, okay, if it's about this size and we can assume that it's independent at that point. Um, so yeah, double checking with a, with a photo, video, um, something like that with, with a professional is probably, I think the most, the best way you can be confident about that sort of thing. Yeah. I think when I was at the front desk, um, especially during baby season, every, every other phone call, at least I'd be asking for a photo. Cause there's just an easy way for us to determine, you know, maybe how old they are, especially in comparison to something else. Um, I think for possums, it's about, about eight inches from nose to the base of the tail, I think is when they're, if they're about that size, they should be okay on their own. Mm -hmm. um, just to give people an idea of, of when they're okay on their own. Um, I do see a question in the chat here, going back to, um, you know, bringing the, the mother in for, for rehabilitation staff to remove them from the nipple. Um, Lauren says, you know, that she has been told that it's best to remove them herself because they can sometimes get sepsis from the deceased mother's milk. Um, but she's also read that it's dangerous to remove them. Um, so she's kind of wondering which we recommend. And that is, you know, I think that is a concern. We don't, you know, while they're on that nipple, they could be getting some things that's not quite good for them. Um, but I think if you're able, you know, if someone's able to get them to a, a rehabilitator relatively quickly, you know, if it's best to, to wait that extra 30 minutes to get them to that rehabilitator for them to remove it. I think, you know, a lot of cases they may have been, that mother may have been dead for eight hours, 24 hours, something like that, where they had been constantly still trying to maybe um, drink her milk, um, which can be bad for them. But I think that added 30 minutes to an hour, whatever that added time it takes to get it to a rehabilitator, um, the concern of the public taking them removing them from the nipple themselves is riskier than, than leaving them attached and getting them to the center, if that makes yeah. sense, Lauren. And I think that's a, that question brings up an awesome point where, again, it's a lot of gray area and you're finding, you're navigating yeah. through these, these specifics, um, a lot of which are, are unknowns, to try to find the best possible solution in an already unideal situation. So that's a great point um, that it's, there are, are different ways it can go, um, but generally this is gonna be the, the safer option, at least until a professional can, can take a look. Yeah, that's a, that is a good point. There are a lot, there's like so many gray areas or things that are difficult to navigate. So calling a rehabber is, is so important. And something you mentioned earlier that I think we should mention for all the, the mammals we spoke with is PPE. of like, you know, having that protective equipment as well. So like make sure you're wearing gloves, um, and that you're, you're wearing the proper equipment if you ever do need to contain an animal or something like that. Ideally, masks in this day and age for mammals as well, yeah. which thankfully we all have access to. <laughs> um, but moving on to something that's not mammals. We've been speaking about mammals for a while, so I figured let's transition to another one of the common ones, uh, songbirds, which I think we got our first songbird patient of the year just the other day, so it's a good time to be talking about it. 
And I think something that's interesting about songbirds that maybe is that they have, you know, distinct stages of life, similar to what we showed with the possum. They they go from, you know, hatchling to nestling to fledgling to adult. Uh, and I think sometimes people can have a difficult time telling the difference between those stages, but it's really important for us to find out so we can determine the, the, the proper thing to do. Um, so can you give the little, little people a little bit of information about those, those three stages of, of life, or, or four, I should say, including the adult uh, four birds? Yeah, so uh, we essentially have um, hatchlings, which are essentially newborn songbirds. Um, and obviously at that point are still going to be in the nest, um, ideally. And then we have um, the nestling stage, which is where we're developed a little bit more, but we, um, you know, we're a little bit better about thermoregulation, but we're still very much needing um, constant parental care, feeding, and we're going to be in that nest still. Maybe a little bit more, a little bit more vocal at that point as they're getting a little older. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so we're going to be, um, very soon developing, um, and at that stage, that nestling stage too, we're still gonna have very minimal um, feathers, like feather coverage on us. You're still gonna see a lot of like feathered shafts, like bare, um, naked songbird babies, basically. Um, uh, but a little bit later, um, when we start to develop, um, you know, have more coverage, more, more fully feathered, um, we're gonna have a lot of this furry, cotton ball -y looking down feathers on us. That's where in the fledgling stage, um, where at that point, these babies are purposefully leaving the nest um, to start to develop their flight skills on the ground. Um, again, this entire time, mom and dad, generally both parents are still very much taking care of these babies and are essential to them being fed. Um, but you know, uh, those three stages are pretty distinct and they're easy enough to tell or get a rough estimate with a picture or video. Um, but those stages are so distinct because depending on what stage it is, gives you an idea of if where you find it is appropriate or not. So obviously those younger hatchling nestling songbirds, we want them to be in the nest. They need to be in the nest to be safe. Um, if it's a fledgling, you know, we're supposed to be out of the nest at that point. So. Yeah, I think that's where a lot of people get caught up is probably the fledglings because it's, it's normal for them to be on the ground. Um, but people maybe don't know that. It's kind of weird for people to come across a bird on the ground that doesn't look like it's quite fully grown yet. They, they can see it can hop but can't fly. And they assume that it's either a baby that needs to go back in the nest or an adult that's injured. It's kind of like that, that awkward in between where people don't quite know. So I think that's where people get a, a little bit caught up. Um, but that is normal for a fledgling to be on the ground. If someone finds a baby bird outside of the nest and they contact us, um, what what will we have them do? Again, picture, 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 or video. That that's really key um, because again, depending on what age that bird is, how much feather coverage tells us if where they found it is safe or appropriate. Um, so that really is is probably number one. And sometimes a picture can give us an idea not just of what age or development stage it's in, but that species might have some particular information or natural history that helped us either to understand if it needs to be remessed, and if so, where, uh, where to look for the nest. Um, so things like that, you know, songbirds um, have a huge variety of different nest types, nest structures, um, and that can be really important to the whole renesting process as well. Um, so picture, again, is just the most important resource that we have at the front desk to make sure we're making the right decisions. Yeah, just think about like some of the variety of those nests, like a kind of cavity nesters, for example, I guess is one that's very different than the ones that have that classic kind of like bowl shape to them. So um, yeah, pictures will definitely help us determine, you know, what kind of nest it is, which can help us, you know, give them advice on where to look. So very, very important to know. Um, I think another concern a lot of people have when they're renesting is there, there's there's certainly some myths out there. One of the most common ones being, you know, if a person touches a bird, um, their smell, getting their smell on that bird will prevent the parents from coming back and, and continuing to care for them. And we know that's not true. 
you know, that is a myth. So you don't need to be concerned about that. But there are some valid steps people can take um, as they're re-nesting birds. Um, what are some stuff that you would recommend to people that, you know, once, let's say they found the nest, I mean, is there some, some particular things they should look out for or do? Um, if we're able to find the actual original nest that this baby may have fallen out of, putting it back in that nest is ideal. Um, just because the parent obviously already knows where it is. Um, it's, it's natural, you know, habitat environment. Um, but, you know, we also want to make sure that that nest is, is viable. So we want to make sure there aren't other maybe dead babies in that same nest, um, because that might give us an indication that something else is going on. Uh, it might not be a viable nest to return that baby to. Um, and um, if, for, if we can't, a lot of times these nests are way out of reach of people or they're just hard to find. Uh, but if we have a general idea of where this baby came from, you know, if it's a small, even a fledgling songbird that can hop and walk around, they're not going to be too far from that original nest location. So often we can provide them with substitute nests, basically placeholder nests that uh, if we can't reach the original, we can at least put them in um, a, a position that somewhat replicates, you know, their natural nest. We get them out of the reach of predators. Uh, we put them in a position where mom and dad can still ideally hear them chirping for food and come back and usually just carry on uh, feeding them in that new nest. Um, and, um, and yeah, we're, again, we're keeping them out of the reach of, of things like domestic dogs and cats and um, uh, giving them the best possible chance in a, again, unideal scenario. I guess that's another example of why it's important for us to figure out the species because if we have to make an artificial nest, um, it might be different for one species th to the next. Um, and I think one one concern people should probably keep out uh, keep a watch for as they're nesting is if if the baby is cold, uh, just to make sure you're warming it up before returning it to that nest. Because uh, yes. if, you, if you do place the the baby back in the nest cold. Um, then there's a chance that to protect the other babies that might be in the nest, the, the mother or, or father bird might kind of either not care for it or push it out of the nest to protect them. So, um, you know, what you can do is, you know, if it's just a little cold, you can maybe cup it in your hands a little bit to help it warm up or put it in a box in a warm, dark, quiet area, maybe on some supplemental heat, like a rice sock or still, till it's just warm enough to return to that nest. Um, another concern that people have too is once they re-nest a bird, is a lot of times, at least when I'm talking to people, they don't have the time to stick around to watch for the parents, or there's nowhere they can watch for the parents that they're not going to intrude on them, you know, no window they can watch from or something. So what's one way people can make sure that even though they can't stay there to watch, that the, the birds are still being cared for? Yeah, it's really, really easy to, and it's actually kind of part of the, say if we had to um, re-nest or create a substitute nest for a baby that's fallen out. Uh, if we put that back in there, especially if we're already putting like supplemental heat sources in, um, what we can do is put um, a little tissue. So we can do the tissue test. Uh, basically, if we see after several hours or even a day or so um, that that bird is continuing to produce, you know, feces, urates, waste, essentially, that means it's still being fed by a parent because obviously this bird's not going out and getting its own food parents are coming down and, and feeding it. So if we see any signs of waste, um, and obviously um, the animal should appear somewhat alert and bright as well. If we're seeing all those, those signs, um, then we can be pretty confident that the parents have resumed care. So the tissue test is a, is a great um, tool, super easy to do, um, and everyone has access to tissues, right? So yeah, something that we all we all have, whether it's tissues or toilet paper or something that we can easily put in put in there. So that's a great way to tell. And, and you're right too, making sure that like you know they're also not becoming dull or their health doesn't appear to be deteriorating as well. Um, I do see a couple of questions in the in the chat. One is from Lacey. Um, she she's asking um, for the wildlife center since we're on the topic of birds now. Um, have we gotten many calls about the um, HPAI, the avian, the highly, path, uh, highly pathogenic avian influenza, and how that has admit um, affected our, our admitting process for patients? And I think Michael, you probably probably know best on this one. 
Yeah, I've been um, doing a lot of just monitoring of the situation, which, um, you know, is being uh, monitored by the various governmental organizations that really uh, take a proactive approach to, to minimizing the effect of something like this. Uh, I, we haven't received very many calls about it. I don't think it's the sort of thing that has really um, been very evident uh, to the general public. Uh, it's, so it's not kind of like that unexplained mortality event that we had in the northern part of the state last year with songbirds. Um, this is a lot of the focus um, is on domestic poultry um, and preventing exposure to those types of facilities because um, they really have um, the most to lose, I guess you could say. Um, it, it spreads rapidly and is has a huge, highly, very high mortality rate um, in domestic poultry. So um, Having said that, um, thankfully, our ability to admit avian patients at the Wildlife Center of Virginia has not changed. However, um, the biosecurity protocols that we take extremely seriously um, have been um, ramped up to counter uh, the possibility of this even coming remotely close to our front doors. Um, you know, we already take um, so many biosecurity precautions, but we're just going the extra mile um, with the advice given to us by the CDC and USDA, USGS, um, you know, foot baths at every, every door, making sure we don't um, have any interaction with people who might have domestic chickens at home that might bring an animal to the center, things like that. We, we take very seriously because um, we want to protect our avian patients and our avian education ambassadors um, at all costs. Yeah, definitely. We have um, you know a host of different biosecurity me uh, measures, like you mentioned, like foot baths, um, different gowns that the veterinary team might wear, certain certain areas where you might isolate the more high risk individuals to transmit you know avian influenza. So um, we are taking that very seriously. So I'm glad you um, you brought that up, Lacey. Um, but luckily, it has not interfered with our ability to admit any of those, um, those avian patients. And I see- It might be worth mentioning, Connor, um, that uh, although thankfully our um, admissions process hasn't been altered as of yet, um, it probably is um, the case for a lot of private, or, you yeah. know, or a lot of individual rehabilitators or even rehabilitation facilities across the state and across other states. So just something to keep in mind. Yeah, that's true. There, there is more constraints on other rehabilitators. So like it may be, more difficult for you to maybe sometimes find a rehabilitator if you're not located near us, for example, um, and you're trying to find a rehabber that they could be impacted by this. So that's something to take into consideration. Um, I also saw a comment from someone that it, this is a really good point of like, you know, right now we're, we're telling people about um, the context for things and things to be aware of. Um, but in addition to knowledge, it's also important to be ready with supplies. So someone posted in the chat that she keeps a cardboard box in her car with gloves, a towel, a pillowcase, um, all these different um, resources. So that's another thing that any of you guys can consider because you're more likely to come across babies during this time or, or injured wildlife, um, but you never know where that might be. And it's always nice to have those, those supplies on you at any time to help them out. Um, so let's see. Let's go over to, I think, I think that's about, we can wrap it up for, for songbirds, but before we move on from birds entirely, um, I think we can briefly mention that there's also baby raptors that we're sometimes admitting to the center. Um, and they can be a little bit trickier to deal with than songbirds. There's just some other concerns that we have for them. And what are those concerns? Uh, one of the biggest concerns, um, at least in terms of, of admitting that sort of patient is uh, baby raptors. Um, so, you know, owls, hawks, eagles, um, they are a huge risk for human imprinting. So, um, you know, they can be at that young age, um, we can risk habituating them too much to us through pretty minimal interaction, you know, vocal, us talking around them, us even them even being able to see our faces. Uh, can imprint on them in a way that will eventually make them, you know, not as successful in the wild um, because they don't see us as, um, you know, predators to stay away from. Um, but um, 
so when, for example, today we actually had, I think, two fledgling great horned owls come in. Um, so before they come in, besides wearing, um, I, I will put on a hat with um, basically camouflage all over my face. So only my eyes can see through. Um, but this owl is essentially just seeing a mass of camouflage and, and netting. Um, so I don't look like a human. Um, and, and I'm also not speaking or making any noise at whole time, again, to reduce that risk of imprinting. Um, and then on the other side, a more obvious uh, thing is these are still raptors that have natural weapons. They still have sharp talons and sharp beaks, even um, at a very young age, even at a nestling age. So that's also something to be mindful for, uh, mindful of uh, for your own safety and health. Yeah, definitely a little trickier to deal with them. So I think, you know, if you find a baby raptor, it's always important to, you know, call a center for any animal you're concerned about, for, for, but for baby raptors, um, you know, call, call right away for sure and try to minimize your contact with them so that they don't accidentally, you know, start to imprint on you and associate with people because that can make them hard to release or, or place back into the wild. Um, but moving on back on to mammals, um, we haven't seen these guys yet, but I know come a little over a month, probably around May is when we'll start receiving calls about white-tailed deer fawns. Um, something that, you know, everybody loves to see out in the wild. Um, and I think that unfortunately, though, a lot of people, when they find a fawn, typically they see them alone and they assume maybe that they're, they're orphaned because there's no mom around. And that's how a lot of accidental kidnappings happen. And it's, it's particularly high with this species. Why, um, why do you think that is? Um, I think... It's similar to cottontails in a lot of ways, but I think the main thing for fawns is the cuteness factor. You know, there is a certain look to, we have a certain draw to these kinds of animals as, as people, something with very large eyes um, and has this seemingly helpless expression. Um, and they're just super abundant. Um, so we'll come across them more. Um, and when we see this seemingly helpless critter um, just kind of lying there. Um, it's it's a very human reaction to want to provide care, um, but really the opposite is generally the the best uh, approach is to remain hands off. If you're unsure, again, call someone like us, call a rehabilitator or a wildlife center um, that can um, try to figure out based on what you're seeing um, if this fawn is actually in need or not. Yeah, because it could be a little little difficult, um, you know, to assess for fawns whether they're truly orphaned. But there are signs that we look out for, you know, and them being alone is not one of them. There's other things that we take into account to determine whether a fawn is one that we want people to bring into the center to see, you know, see what's going on with it. So what are some of those signs that we might recommend a person look for? Yeah, um, I think um, one of the main things that we'll see in a really, really... Um, Something that makes it pretty clear is if we see evidence of this animal not being like maintained by its parents. So it's got, um, you'll see a, a like fly strike or a lot of flies or maggots around the tail end of the deer. Um, we'll see a large buildup of ticks on the deer, basically me sh showing us that mom isn't manicuring, um, you know, caring for uh, this deer. It doesn't have her to like uh, maintain its hygiene. Um, so that's one bit of evidence that, <clears throat> okay, obviously it's already it, um, not in great condition, you know, hygienically, it's got all of these parasites on it. Um, so at, at that point, we, we probably want to give some care to that fawn. Yeah, so like, you know, presence of insects, um, diarrhea, um, obvious <laughs> wounds, of course, any of those types of things, signs that even though, you know, we don't see mom around, we know that mom's probably not in the picture with those. Yeah, things. other things like um, if we're constantly vocalizing um, throughout like the entire night, it's not unusual to hear them vocalizing during the day. This sort of sounds like they're in distress, but it's really if they're keeping that vocalization up like throughout the entire night, that's yeah. a sign that um, we might be orphaned. Also, if we're lying in sort of an abnormal posture, if we're sort of uh, lying on our side with our feet splayed out, um, that's not a typical, you know, that's not a sign of a healthy 
fawn necessarily. If they're kind of curled up with their legs tucked underneath them, that's what we want to see. We want to see them like laying comfortably on the ground. But if they're sort of splayed out on the ground, you know, sort of head down, um, limbs splayed out, then that's another indicator. Yeah, those are that's that's good. Some other things to look out for, and I think that uh, that's a good point. That when people hear fawns, when they hear them crying out, that's another thing that just indicates to people like, oh, it must must be orphan. Um, but that's not the case, you know, unless maybe you're hearing it for just a constant, you know, hours and hours on end, that might be concerning. But if you're only hearing it periodically for 15 minute intervals, it's probably just calling to mom and letting letting her know that it's hungry and wants to be fed. Um, and for fawns, we know, you know, it's, it's really important for this species to contact a rehabilitator before moving them anywhere to figure out what's going on with them because there's certain restrictions with fawns and rehabilitation that we don't have for a lot of other wild animals. Um, what are, can you tell us a little bit about those restrictions and, and why they're in place and why it's a concern? Yeah, um, a lot of it is, um, you know, disease management related. Um, there are certain areas, certain counties within the state um, that the Department of Wildlife Resources um, has deemed those are those are counties in which chronic wasting disease has been detected. Um, so we don't we want to minimize uh, you know our moving around of these contagious fatal diseases to deer. Um, same and also now uh, you know in the past couple of years COVID nineteen is a very real concern with 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 uh, white tailed deer as well. Um, so. Those are a couple of things, in, in addition to the obvious, you know, figuring out if we're doing more harm than good than even trying to, um, uh, you know, rescue this fawn, you know, that, that comes into, you know, calling someone beforehand gives you hopefully the assurance to determine if what we, if we actually need to do anything or not. Um, all of those other factors, um, the disease management, I think, is our other biggest concern. And that's where those regulations, those laws are really in place to not only protect the animals, but the people that might be interacting with them as well. Yeah, so definitely important to, you know, call a rehabilitator so we can figure out what the restrictions might be for the area that you're in um, so that we can get the best advice in that situation, as well as just figuring out whether that animal truly needs help. Um, but moving on to another, another type of animal, which I think you would be very upset if we didn't yeah. if we didn't cover this topic. They're one of your favorites is reptiles. And this is luckily an easy one when it comes to people calling us about baby reptiles, usually baby turtles, I'd say, um, small snapping turtles, small box turtles that they find that are alone. And um, we're actually, you know, glad to hear these types of phone calls because we can quickly give some very easy advice and what is the situation there for the for those young reptiles michael yeah for sure um unlike pretty much anything we've discussed already reptiles once they have successfully hatched they are independent essentially these guys are beginning life on their own um so a lot of the same advice um and information we give to folks who find you know fully developed adult reptiles applies similarly, um, or ex it's the exact same advice often for folks who find tiny baby turtles that are, you know, uh, not much bigger than a half dollar or so. These animals are, are unless, again, you're seeing any obvious injuries, um, obvious signs of disease, um, like swelling of the eyes, these are animals that are okay to leave where they are. Um, maybe help them off the road if they're in a precarious position, you know, um, in the direction that they were already heading. Um, but yeah, um, it's, it's cool to see, um, but it's a good rest assured feeling that someone has like, okay, this baby is where it's supposed to be, um, at this stage. Yeah, definitely. I think the one, the one thing what we mentioned too, is for people not to, to move, you know, move them in the direction they're going, um, but not move them far at all from where they're found because reptiles generally have very small home ranges. So while they're okay to be on their own when they're, when they're really young like that, um, don't want to move them. Like sometimes people say, well, I feel like they're, you know, the park down the street might be safer for them, but they don't do well if they're relocated outside of that home range. So good to keep them where they're at. Um, another thing that, you know, while people sometimes come across, I guess, is they're digging up maybe in the garden or, or something and they come across reptile aches. 
Um, and once they expose them, they're not really sure, you know, what should they do? Do they, you know, just keep them there, cover them back up? So what should people do if they, you know, accidentally dig up reptile eggs? Well, similar to, you know, hatched animals or animals that have been born, you know, determining if there's some damage to it is part of it. You know, I mean, it's not that we will be able to necessarily do anything for a destroyed egg um, or a partially destroyed egg. Um, but if there's no damage, there's no obvious, like, um, if the environment around it is still relatively safe, if we can, um, and if there's no damage to the eggs, we can essentially rebury them um, at a similar depth in uh, you don't want to move them um, really in, in too far in any direction, um, but we want to kind of rebury them and replicate the condition that they were in when we first found them. Uh, a lot of times we find these guys after, you know, there's a larger development, a lot of construction, like heavy duty construction going on. Um, and we still are able to advise on, on you know, essentially re-nesting, um, but for reptiles, uh, which is just burying the eggs back again. But it's there's a lot of um, detail in there, um, probably that I don't personally have uh, that might be species specific um, from reptile to reptile, you know, whether it's snakes or turtles or what have you. Um, so again, harken back to the call a rehabilitator if you're not totally sure, just in case. Yeah, and I think I think um, I think that's the best way to put it. It's kind of like I said, you know, the moms know best in terms of like the area that they they place them. They often felt like it was a good area in terms of like the conditions there for those young. So, you know, as long as you can just try to cover them back up, put them right back where you found them, and hopefully they'll they'll hatch soon and yeah. move on their way. Um, the last concern I'll mention with eggs is that sometimes people don't want to place them back in um, where they're found because they're concerned that they will hatch and that they're a venomous species of snake. I think the most common one we get calls about is, is copperheads that people are concerned about. Um, so if that was someone's concern, what would you tell them? Well, let me say thank you, first of all, for letting me get on my soapbox about uh, you know advocating for for snakes. Um, yeah, I always just thought it was a, it was a, a really cool thing to know that um, all of the venomous species that can be found in Virginia, of which there are only three, um, all of those give live birth to their babies. Um, so if you happen to find um, a clutch of eggs that look like snake eggs, or if you've even seen an adult snake around at some point, you can always, always be sure that that is a non-venomous snake. And I'll just, uh, if that just gives anybody, you know, a sense of relief, which it often does, um, and uh, I will just kind of take the opportunity to advocate and say that um, venomous or non-venomous um, snakes around your home, um, although it's always good to be mindful of the critters around you, um, they are an extremely beneficial and important part of your ecosystem and are often keeping away um, pests that actually could cause damage to your home, um, your garden, or uh, even your health as a human, you know, things like rodents, um, things like that. So snakes are amazing, uh, free pest control. Um, so I just wanted to give a shout out to my favorite, favorite animals that we see here. Yes, I definitely, I definitely had to plug that in since I knew you were going to be here on the program, uh, snakes being one of your favorites. So I think that about covers the, the common types of, of wildlife, young wildlife that we'll see during uh, baby season. Of course, there's, there's many, many different species in addition to that that we might see. Um, but I think there's a couple, a couple things we said over and over again that I'll just repeat one more time so to cover it. And that is the most important thing to do if there's a wild animal that you're concerned about, um, whether it's a young one that you find here during baby season, is call a wildlife rehabilitator for help. We are equipped with the skills and the knowledge to figure out what's going on in every situation. You know, no situation is, is quite the same and give advice on, on what to do. Um, and um, there's certain tools that you can have to prepare for things, whether there's crates, gloves, proper safety equipment. Um, and the most important tool that we mentioned is probably a phone, just to get some photos of, of what you're seeing and send them into us. Um, so thank you guys so much for, for joining us today and hearing us talk about all the different critters we might admit and, and certainly will admit here during the baby season. Um, but before I go, I do want to mention that since we're talking about baby wildlife and ways to help them, uh, we 
just launched today our 2022 Caring for Birds, Caring for Critters sponsorship. So if people uh, want to help contribute to, to our center to help care for the hundreds and hundreds of young uh, wildlife we'll get, specifically birds, because birds are the one, one of the more common ones, um, they can do so through our website. Um, that money will go directly to their feeding, to their medical care, to all you know the incubators, everything that we need to care for these animals. Um, and in return, if you you know if you're choosing to purchase one of these sponsorships, you're going to get a lot of great information, detailed information about different you know different songbird species that we're we're caring for, uh, photos of of a baby songbird patient, um, personalized certificate of sponsorship, periodic email updates. It's a really great program, a really great way for you guys to support the work that we do. Um, with some, some of the young patients we have here um, while also getting something back. And this is a also a really great gift now that we're, you know, entering spring and, you know, maybe you're considering getting gifts for different people. Um, this is the perfect gift for someone. So thank you guys so much for, for joining us today. And um, I hope this, this program has helped equip you with some more knowledge on what to do. And we'll see you guys for the next program. Bye, everybody.